Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Power Women Driving Cultural and Social Change at the Power Women Summit 2022. I'm Janine Jones-Clark, Executive Vice President of Inclusion for Talent and Content across the Universal Filmed Entertainment Group. I'm grateful you've taken time out of your busy day to watch this discussion. As the title of the panel so aptly indicates, the women speaking, the power women that is speaking with me today are essential leaders who are driving cultural and societal change throughout the industry and beyond. Although the panelists' roles and responsibilities are vast and wide ranging, CSR, HR, production talent, they are all part of the same village leading the charge to increase representation in front of the camera, behind the camera, and within the workforce. I'm excited to facilitate what will be an informative and inspiring conversation with a group of peers driving lasting change who I deeply respect. Now let's meet our panelists. Daisy O.J. Dominguez, Chief People Officer, Vice Media Group. Hillary Smith, Executive Vice President of CSR for NBC Universal. Latasha Gillespie, Head of Global Diversity, Equity and Inclusion for Amazon Studios. Ramala Ratnam, SVP, Head of Impact and Inclusion at Endeavor, and Ty Randolph, CEO of Heartbeat. So before we really jump into the conversation, um, let's just have you share a little bit about yourselves, how long you've been in your role, um, maybe a high level description of what you do um, and what you like most about your job. So um, why don't we start with Latasha? <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me on this panel with these amazing, amazing women. So I'm Latasha Gillespie. Uh, I've been at Amazon for six years. The last four of those six have been in my role with Amazon Studios and Prime Video. Uh, the thing that I love uh, most about my job is that, you know, every single day we get to, to wake up and have an impact on increasing humanity in the world. And we do that by ensuring that there's diverse representation in front of the camera, behind the camera, above the line, below the line. We also do that by working with all of our amazing creatives and creative execs to ensure that the stories we tell don't have harmful stereotypes and tropes, but actually show the rich, nuanced, complex characters that mirror our global audience. Uh, and then lastly, we, we are doing a lot of internal examination every day at our own processes, policies, and systems, and figuring out where we should dismantle them and rebuild them with equity uh, to make sure that um, all voices are heard. So really glad to be here with you. Thanks for having me. Great. Thank you, Latasha. Ty, how about you? Good morning. Uh, Ty Randolph here, CEO of Heartbeat. It is a Kevin Hart company. And um, I have been in Kevin's ecosystem for about five years, but I've served in my capacity as CEO um, for the past year after uh, merging two of his entertainment companies to form Heartbeat. And what do I love most about the role? You know, our mission is to keep the world laughing together. And for us, laughter is really um, a conduit to unity. So, you know, what I enjoy most is being able to build a business and tell stories um, that actually, you know, drive more inclusion, uh, create more empathy, and ultimately, you know, hopefully make people's lives just incrementally better every day. Great. Thank you. Hillary. Hi. Uh, I have been at NBC Universal for over two decades, uh, but in this role, just for a year, leading social impact across the brands of NBC Universal. And um, that includes all of our corporate uh, giving. Um, we provide grants to over 45 different nonprofit partners, as well as uh, overseeing the employee engagement and volunteering that goes with that. Um, and then I also, um, manage The More You Know, which is our award-winning PSA campaign. And what I really love most about this role is helping to, you know, impact the communities where we live and work, creating more access and opportunity for underrepresented communities, but also giving our employees the opportunity to give back. So many employees want to work for a company that shares their values and enables them that opportunity. And that's a huge component of our program at NBC Universal. 
great. Thank you. Daisy? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm so pleased and thrilled to be here with uh, these amazing women today. Thank you for having me. Um, Daisy OJ Dominguez, I have um, served as Chief People Officer at Vice Media now for two and a half years. I joined the company um, the beginning of May of 2020. So I was one of those folks who started um, their first jobs all virtually, and I did not meet my boss, our CEO, um, or my entire team, or really anyone in the company for a year. Um, and I am uh, responsible um, for a global team that leads the entire employee um, and to entire employee experience across uh, Vice and the over 20 countries where we operate, from onboarding to uh, to development to retention, promotion, um, your well-being, your um, your everyday experience at work is supported by my team. I'm also responsible for our facilities and for our ESG work. So there's a lot of administrative um, and operational work that goes in every day. Um, and the favorite, you know, what I love the most about my job is the opportunity to reimagine and rebuild um, employee experience, uh, practices, policies, behaviors um, that, that are not just inclusive and equitable, but really human centered, um, that create an experience that is the experience we all want every day to both manage our de the demands that we have at work and the demands that we have in our personal lives. Um, so it's exciting for me to see not just what we're creating, but to hear the feedback from our employees when it works. That's great. And Ramala, you want to bring us home? <laughs> yes. Hi, everyone. So nice to be on this panel with all of you. Um, I work at Endeavor and I manage our social impact and inclusion. So on the impact side, that's our philanthropic giving, employee engagement and volunteerism, um, anything leveraging our access, our resources, our influence to have a social good. And also, especially we have a big focus on uplifting diversity in our industries. And then on the, so I've been doing that role for about five years. And then just about six months ago, merged with the inclusion team. So now oversee our internal diversity and inclusion efforts across the company and all of our businesses. My favorite thing about the job is definitely the diversity of the portfolio that Endeavor is. If any of you know it, it's definitely a ton of different things combined. So everything from ultimate fighting to freeze our art fairs to our events and media company, IMG, to our talent agency, WME, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But being able to look at the entire portfolio and figure out how do we create social change? How do we create inclusive hiring practices? How do we create access and opportunities within all these varied industries um, is very exciting to me. Wow, God, collectively to hear everything you're all doing is just incredible. Um, and I'm sure there's a little bit of exhaustion that goes along with that. We'll get to that a little later. <laughs> but before, um, I'm going to jump into um, talking a little bit about the companies you work for and your business strategies. Um, the values of the companies we work for obviously influence the work that we all do. How do you ensure you and your teams are embedded into the business strategies across your companies? And anyone can jump in. This is for, for everybody. Well, I'll, well I, I can start. Oh, sorry. <laughs> go, go, go. I'll, I'll start on, you know, the... Uh, my team my team is the people and culture team, which is traditionally known as HR, um, which is not often the team that most people think of being side by side with the business. Um, but frankly, as a company, our mission is to create content um, and to, you know, to to shine a light on stories and voices that no one else will shine a light on and that push culture forward. And in order to do that, we need to ensure that our workforce mirrors that those aspirations and and as, as a result it's it's nearly impossible to be recruiting onboarding engaging talent that does not connect with the work that we're doing um, and so the the way that we intersect or if you will the way that we really partner with our teams is every day and somewhat seamlessly it's in decisions about who gets hired and for what reason what the decision making process look like um, you know, whose voices are included in decision making and not, um, whose, whose voices are missing <laughs> from, uh, from these decisions, and how do we make every decision that is attached to the business, which is ultimately a 
a people decision at one point or another in partnership and an engagement towards our higher values and aspirations. Yeah, I was going to, I agree. And I think in the ideal world, these things are inherently part of the business strategy, right? Who you're hiring, who's making decisions, the impact you're having on the world around you. But let's say theoretically, it's not thought of that way. Initially for us, we've tried kind of like a Trojan horse strategy, I think, where on the impact side, there's clear, I think the world has gotten to a place on both, but um, where you know that this is very important to the business, right? The impact for us, we have a lot of consumer facing businesses and the impact that a company has or an event has on the world around it, people want to know. Same thing now, even on the representation side for us, who's on your client team, right? If you're a client and you're a person of color or from an underrepresented group, if you're a woman, a lot of times you want your team to look like you or to represent the communities that you're aiming for. So that's, it's inherent in the business. So we try to identify those places where we can get in because we know that there's the very overt connection where it matches revenue, where you need to demonstrate this to do well. And then once you have the seat at the table, you use that to go to all the things that maybe people don't associate um, as uh, tangibly. So that's how, that's how we kind of do it. I, I, I love that, Matt, and it's, and it's one of the reasons why, you know, in my capacity as CEO, it's still very important for me to join discussions like this, because I think that um, every leader should, should fashion themselves a, a chief inclusion officer, or at least an ambassador of such. You know, I talk a lot about creating organizations that are diverse by design. Um, you know, as a leader, I accept that I don't have all the answers. I also accept that a lot of the answers will come from people who do not look or think like me, right? They're, in fact, more likely to have the answers that I don't have. Um, and I don't believe that, and I think all of these initiatives have to be imperatives that start at the top, right? Um, you know, when I was appointed CEO, um, which is unique in a, a landscape in entertainment, but in comedy particularly, that can be a bit of a boys club, as I've talked about it. The one thing that Kevin said to me was, could you make your experience here the rule and not the exception? And that meant a couple of things, right? It meant that, you know, there were folks who had to move around in the organization to make space for me. Um, it meant that it was a meritocracy, right? Sort of like best idea, best person wins. Um, it also meant that there had to be a lot of mobility. I joined, um, you know, one of his organizations as SVP of marketing and was promoted four times over the course of five years. And so that was my charge as CEO, culture and people was sort of at the top of what we do. Um, you know, and as such, you know, it's one of the biggest KPIs for the company. So I really encourage, you know, every leader, regardless of, you know, where you sit in an organization, if you're in product, marketing, um, you know, customer service, we have, you know, the most um, diverse workforce, the most diverse consumer base globally that we've ever experienced. Um, and I think we all have to be thinking about that pretty critically. Yeah, I love that. I, I would say at NBC Universal, um, you know, we're very much um, committed to a lot of the themes that you guys mentioned. Um, and clearly the thread here is, you know, when it comes to a company culture, it's a culture of inclusion. Um, and how do we help underrepresented communities break through and have a seat at the table? So we um, almost a year ago launched something called the Creative Impact Lab. Um, and the way that it works is that we um, are becoming storytellers for nonprofits themselves. Um, we know that nonprofits have a critical need to tell their important stories about the causes that they embrace. Uh, but rather than NBC Universal becoming a studio that you know creates these marketing assets, we thought, wouldn't it be great to partner with creative organizations um, that are you know 501c3s filled with app apprentices um, who you know are from those underrepresented communities who are dying to get experience in this industry and, and break in. Uh, and so we forged uh, relationships with over a dozen uh, creative nonprofits that are now being commissioned um, to tell the stories of, I mentioned earlier, we have 45 uh, corporate nonprofit partners. They are um, going to be telling those stories and then our NBC employees serve as mentors on each one of those storytelling projects. And so, you know, I think, you know, with this program, you know, we're accomplishing a number of objectives, obviously, to shine a light on these important causes. Um, but just building on what all of you have said, you know, that creative agency group um, that's getting this experience and exposure to our mentors, those are the people that we want, you know, behind the cameras, um, you know, in the future. And so we're really trying to shepherd that along. Yeah, I'm going to just plus one everything 
uh, these brilliant women have already said, and then just add a couple points. One, uh, and just to clarify, my role um, is a little different than my colleagues here who, who serve in HR. I, I've, I've been in the HR world for 17 years of my career, so my, my hat's off to, to those folks doing that work. Uh, the work that I do today is uh, specifically on customer and content. So it's really working around making sure we're reaching um, our global audiences in an authentic way, and then also working with the content and content creators. So I, I say that to say, I think even positioning in the organization um, is important. So, you know, having done DEI on both sides of, of the field on in the HR world and in the business world, I have found that like being being a business leader or, or being a lot, not that my HR colleagues are not business leaders, they are. Um, but sitting in the business and reporting to the head of the studio, I think also has um, helped drive a lot of initiatives um, because I think people sometimes have a mental model about DEI is. And so when you position it somewhere different, I think sometimes you can break some of those mental models we all have been fighting for years. Uh, the, the second thing I'd add is that um, as we are all going through some sort of strategic planning process in our organizations, I think it's really important for us to be in those conversations, you know, with all of the other business lines to really talk about and, and to ensure that whatever goals we are setting at the organizational level um, are congruent uh, with the goals that we're all trying to achieve in our roles uh, and also that that DEIA piece is embedded or that corporate social responsibility piece is embedded in those strategic organizational goals because to Ty's point it makes everyone the chief inclusion officer or the chief uh, CSR um, and, and the responsibility is shared. And then the last thing I'll just add is that um, one of the things I have found to be critically important uh, in order to make sure that we have a broader impact in the business is to make sure we understand who our business is and what our business does. We all need to understand the widget that we make because I have seen uh, times when this kind of work uh, has a goal or a mechanism to achieve it that doesn't feel congruent with how the business does everything else. It doesn't feel organic to how the business normally runs. And anytime you have to ask a leader or an employee to step outside of the normal process to do something, uh, you have a greater risk that they won't do it. So I think it's really important to understand how your organization works, how you build the widget and make sure that the mechanisms that you are are building, implementing and driving feel very organic to the natural way you do business. Absolutely. I agree. Well, a plus one plus one with everything that you guys said. Absolutely. And I, and I think, you know, you've all hit on something that's very important is, you know, the work we do is crucial. But I think what's also an imperative is for leadership to also be working and doing what we're doing and by our sides and championing our work so that we can, as I like to say, infiltrate the business and be just a common part of the process, you know, just as common as a budget, DEI, just as common, the norm. Yeah. Um, okay, so one more question in this area. I just kind of, you know, we're all hearing about what's coming up uh, in 2023. We're already seeing challenges just in life in general while we're heading out of 2022. Are there any challenges that you anticipate facing in the coming year? You know, um, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, you know, I think we've talked a lot about, particularly on the entertainment side, how it seems that we're entering this recessionary climate, right? We've seen layoffs across the board. And, um, and just a lot of sort of innovation and disruption happening in, in our spaces, right? How content is consumed, where it's being delivered, the pricing models around it. Um, and, you know, in, in many cases where there was a sort of arms war from a content perspective, right? We're now seeing this kind of shift to a race to the bottom as opposed to the top. Like, how do we protect margins? How do we protect the bottom line? Um, and, you know, what's the concern or the risk regarding the conversation that we're having is that if the D and I work, if the D and I work does not seem a business imperative, it will be up on the chopping block, right? If you have not made a business case for it, if you do not look at, you know, building inclusive organizations is critical to the success, the profitability, the scaling of your company and its objectives, um, you know, those are the things that, that are, are greatly at risk. So, you know, my hope is that we don't lose some of the ground that we've gained, um, you know, because the, the pandemic really served as a bit of a catalyst um, and, and a mirror. And uh, but it, those things, as we know, can be easily undone. So I, I would say that's one of the big risks ahead. 
I agree with that. And, and I think, you know, if we look back, um, you know, it, I guess it was 2020 when the George Floyd tragedy happened and many companies, um, Comcast, which is NBC Universal's parent company, um, you know, as well, made commitments to support social justice. Um, and Comcast made a hundred million dollar pledge over three years um, in this respect. And it's hard to believe, but those three years come to an end um, in 2023. And so I think it's so important that companies don't just, you know, pull the plug on those efforts. We're trying to figure out, you know, creative ways to, you know, continue some of that funding, um, you know, maybe even, you know, if we're stepping down the funding, but not, you know, pulling the plug um, and just, you know, making sure that, you know, the spirit of that donation remains um, and that, you know, if, if, you know, every company all of a sudden, you know, is in the same boat, um, these nonprofits are really going to feel it. Um, so it's important to keep them, you know, a part of the agenda and figure out, um, you know, how to still collaborate um, and work towards those social justice efforts. Yeah. I think in writer to strike. Oh, sorry. Arnold. Go, go. I was going to say writer strike, global recession, and diversity fatigue. Uh, mm. And on top of all of that, we the pandemic has changed the way we do things. It's yeah. changed the way we consume content. And some of that will never go back to the ways of old. So we are constantly reinventing how we meet our customers' needs uh, and continue to delight them, even when they just want to sit on their couch and consume it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with everything everyone says. I think in addition to resources, right, is there less money? It's also share of mind, I think, too. If, if leaders are really stressed and strapped and feeling kind of more vulnerable or insecure or whatever it is, they have less space to do kind of the hard work to lean into some of some of the change that's needed internally. And I think that's something to, to keep in mind as we get, like, if this gets bad, where people's heads are going to be at. Um, in addition to even if you have your budget, do you have like the mental resources you need from your leaders to, to move the work forward? That's such a that's such a good point. Um, Janine, when you asked your question, I kind of just gasped because I said, well, what challenge? Because <laughs> there's so many as Latasha. <laughs> I was like, Wait, like the, the list just keeps on getting longer. Yeah. I feel like yeah. I feel like none of us have been able to just step up and you know take a breather since March of 2020 um and you know and it, and and our list just keep on getting um getting longer um but i i'd add um to everything everybody has said um you know 2023 is going to be a lot more impossible decisions to be made um regarding people regarding business strategy regarding um you know everything that um we we've been talking about everything having changed since the pandemic. But the fact of the matter is, is that humans resist change as much as it comes at them. And we're still managing change, right? There's still a lot of individuals and, you know, and I think Romola, I want to, you know, emphasize what you just said, that that heart and mind space of people accepting all of the, ch all of the change that has already occurred, people are still going through it. And we are still adding more change on people's um, you know, limited bandwidths. Um, so I think 2023, I've been thinking a lot about re-onboarding our workforce, um, reminding everybody of who we are, what we stand for, who we are within this new set of experiences and, and who we are. So there's a bit of a re-onboarding of, oh, you thought that's how we worked? Well, this is really how, you know, how work looks like now. Um, as many of us have to say goodbye to a lot of our colleagues and 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 processes that we whether we like it or not, had become accustomed to and resources that we liked that are no longer there. Um, and also managing that workforce that is still here, taking us to that next step. And then I think, Ty, your point around it really being about leadership and management, that is, that's the second piece that I'm highly focused on, on how do we ensure that this is not the work of just one team or one person, but that this is a shared accountability across the organization. And we use those words in corporate space a lot, but I, I mean it, right? That we are all putting on, you know, in our backpack, we all carry it, right? It's This is everybody's responsibility. And when a manager calls me up and says, hey, Daisy, I need XYZ, you know, most of my managers and leaders know I always go, what's like, that's not my job. I was like, my job is to help guide you through this. Your job is to execute on this. Um, and it's it's clarity on the roles that we play, the support that we give to each other, and then a whole lot of leaning into compassion because we all need a little bit of that every single day. 
absolutely. Um, could not agree with you ladies more. Um, we're going to take a little bit of a pivot, and I really want to do a deep dive and have you speak to some of the individual work you're all doing on the front lines. So I'm going to start with Romola. You know, with your role um, at Endeavor, you're working with talent across the content spectrum. Can you share how programs like Change Hollywood help create access for underrepresented talent? Yeah, so Change Hollywood was an initiative between one of our business areas, WME. Um, it was actually founded by one of our clients, Michael B. Jordan, along with the Racial Justice Organization, Color of Change. And the idea was to create a blueprint for systemic change across Hollywood. So that would be, so the approach was this insider outsider approach, an actor producer on the inside with a racial justice organization on the outside, looking at all of the ways that the industry is part of, contributes to, or can combat larger inequities within society. So for that, it, there's not a direct tie to talent per se, but what it really is, is looking at the structural changes in systems. So it's one step away, but I think that's actually where you need to start. I came from an international development background. And you really always look at the structures and the systems first. So things like, I mean, one thing I guess that, that you could put under this would be the inclusion rider. So Endeavor Content, our studio at the time, no longer, unfortunately, they, um, they actually implemented inclusion rider principles into their hiring. So what does that mean? That means that actually embedded into their hiring process, they had things like a diverse slate. They ensured that they had to go out to a certain amount of what we call diversity advocacy organizations, DAOs. Um, and they actually tracked who applied, who got the role, and how that compares to the city in which that they were filming in. So that's a structural difference. And when you actually have those numbers and you're doing that, not because the, the original inclusion writer, for those of you that know, was talent coming on top saying, you have to do this for me to be in your production. But for them to adopt it across the board was an example of systemic change, with that, which then sometimes even just having the data makes you act better, frankly and it makes you measure it. And we actually saw that that was the case with, with Endeavor content. And that's an example of if you can diverse, if you can slow down your hiring process to include more people into it, to make better hiring decisions, and then look at that across your entire slate and how you're improving year over year, that creates more opportunities for, for people that had less opportunity to begin with, right? Because we know line producers are super busy, hiring extremely fast, they are not going to necessarily consider every single application because they're going to go with people they know. But when you force that slowing, you're creating more opportunities. So that's just an, one example. Um, another one as part of it is that we committed to, we created this system that allowed our clients, so we have a lot of writers and filmmakers that we represent, to be able to bring in their scripts. And we would actually, free of charge, so we funded the program, help provide notes and commentary and connect them with experts to create more culturally representative and accurate scripts. So that's something that we also created through that program. Again, that's not a direct tie, but if you have more authentic portrayals, you ideally have more opportunities for people from underrepresented groups, whether that be on screen, behind the scenes, in the writer's room, um, and even in the marketing and the eventual delivery of the, of the content. So that's some of the stuff that that program did. But the ideal was really not just let's represent a lot more people of color, which we should, like everyone should be, and we will and we do but it was about how do we change the actual structures that are contributing to the underrepresentation in the agency itself yeah great thank you um latasha amazon's inclusion policy and playbook um it's open to the entire industry as a resource and i think it's phenomenal by the way um you know you encourage other organizations to tinker with it give constructive <laughs> feedback um share key learnings other key learnings I mean, it's basically like open source software for DEI strategies. <laughs> um, are there any anything you can share, any learnings you can share on how other companies can incorporate that kind of tech company philosophy into our work? <laughs> so thank you for asking me about that. Uh, I think my background and experience having spent over 20 plus years in other industries, including manufacturing tech, has really... Um, allowed me to bring some of those experiences into the work that I do today. Our inclusion policy and playbook was a mechanism that was launched in response to the murder of George Floyd. So we understood we had a window of time 
where people were going to be really open to change, both not only in, in mental mindsets, but also in structure policies and systems. And so we wanted to make sure that we did something meaningful uh, in that window. And so really it's our opportunity, you know, for us to really put a stake in the ground and say, this is what we think good looks like. And if you're going to do business with us, this is what we're asking you to do with us in terms of how you staff your project, again, in front of the camera, behind the camera, above the line and below the line. Uh, one of the reasons why we um, took this open source uh, method is because we understand that we don't have all the answers and we didn't launch it because we've done everything right. We didn't launch it because we're going to do everything right in the future. We launched it because we understood that we needed to do something other than say we must do better. Because we've been saying that as an industry for a long time. Right. And so we needed to put a stake in the ground and say, here's what we think good looks like. If you don't have anything, we're encouraging you to adopt it. If you figure out a better way of doing it, then adapt it and share it back with us, because it's really going to take all of us, which is why I'm so you know, grateful to be on this conversation with these uh, women, because it really does take all of us holding hands and doing this together. The images that we put out into the world are powerful. And there's a responsibility that comes with that. Because in my belief, I think the reason why a man like George Floyd can be murdered in broad daylight with witnesses and recordings is because sometimes the images that have been out in the world have allowed us to dehumanize each other. And so it's really important that we take accountability for making sure that we entertain you, but we also do it in a way that increases your humanity toward each other. Yeah. Love that. Love that. Um, let me recover from that great, eloquent answer. <laughs> um, no, that was wonderful. Um, I'm going to pivot and, and Daisy kind of jump into your world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, now more than ever, uh, work culture is a priority. Employees have wholly different expectations, you know, coming back to work since we've gone through what we've gone through with the pandemic and, and, and beyond. So from that workforce perspective, can you share how you foster an inclusive culture advice and maybe give us any tips? Yeah, sure. It's uh, as, as with everything, it's a work in progress. Um, I like to remind people that um, Vice is a youth media company. We're constantly um, sharing and creating what's next, which means that for Folks that are concerned about employee expectations having shifted now, our employee expectations had already shifted a couple of years ago, right? They're always they're always way ahead of the curve, um, and and that means that we need to have managers who are incredibly competent and confident in in their ability to engage with this workforce, um, to engage with the uncomfortable. Um, conversations, to engage with the language that they're still not quite, you know, there with, to understand what it means um, to have, uh, you know, someone talk about well-being and trauma and danger in the workplace in a, in a way that doesn't feel anachronistic to what the workplace should be, but simply a, a way of integrating it into your day-to-day. -day. Um, and, you know, and the way, for us, inclusion has always been uh, you know, an, an element of our culture, but we have to, you have to recognize that saying it and doing it are two different things and, and saying it and putting it on paper and experiencing it are also very different. And so I often remind folks what we say externally has got to mirror the ex experience of our employees. There cannot be a disconnect or a gap because we've, we've, we've already, then we've failed. And so a lot of our work is really about ensuring that, um, that our storytelling matches our everyday experience, that the language that we're using, that um, how we listen and engage employees. And I often talk to peers about the fact that I spend most of my time engaging with employees on a day-to-day -day basis. And sometimes, you know, it, it's, it, it, can, it can feel overwhelming, but I, I can't do my job well if I don't know where the sore spots are in the organization. And that means that I need to hear directly from employees through my team, of course, and my team are brilliant and they are the, they are, they're really just every day there connecting with folks, but it is piecing together those stories and, and being able to discern what, you know, what needs to be, you know, what, what is something that we react to or something that we respond to, right? That these are two very different things. In the summer of 2020, everybody was reacting to everything that was happening. And I was, I was really desperately trying to 
hold on to whatever little moments of peace we could so that we could respond in a way that could really approach this work in a systemic way, in a structured way, in an integrated way that wasn't about just fixing one, fixing with one Band-Aid now what, what could be fixed systemically and, and organic and, and holistically throughout the organization. So for us, our culture is about making sure that the systems and the processes are working for people, right? That we're, we're recruiting inclusively, that we're retaining and developing talent in an equitable way, that folks feel heard, valued, safe, that they come to a workplace where they feel that their dignity is intact, where they feel that they're understood, and, and that when we mess up, because we do all the time, um, that we pick ourselves up and we address what needs to be addressed. And an example of that, I'll say this because many of us have been handling return to office, right? I, I joke about it. I was like, there's no such thing as one return to office. We've had multiples and we will have multiple <laughs> for the next couple of years. Um, but as we were getting geared towards, I think it was a third wave of it. One of our employees expressed concern about the layout, the open layouts and offices not being conducive to a great workplace environment for neurodiverse talent and that the noise and the light was 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 bothering them. And, you know, we all looked around and we said, yeah, you know what? we designed these spaces and none of the folks who designed these spaces had any of these challenges. So we're going to address this, not just through an accommodation, right? An accommodation is something that you're legally required to do, but as, as, a, as, a, as, as a true design solution to what we're doing. And, and we thanked them and we acknowledged it. I was like, that was a miss on our part and we're going to address that going forward. This is how you do it. It's not running away from your missteps, but is acknowledging that we will all make missteps. I make them all the time. And I need to allow myself some grace. I need to allow grace to others to be able to say, okay, I messed up. It's not going to happen again. I'm going to work on it. And that's the kind of, that's the kind of inclus inclusion and equity work that we do all the time, which is making sure that our systems are aligned, that what we say and what we do is connected and that we, are, we offer ourselves grace and space to be make to make mistakes and to together inform what the decisions are going forward. Thank you, Daisy. Um, so Hillary, as an NBCU employee, um, I can honestly say I feel like so many great opportunities and strategies come out that are done in such a thoughtful way um, that really make you appreciate being a part of this culture. I've heard you mention a phrase that really resonates with me the new face of volunteering. Um, it's really, I think NBCU has made volunteering more meaningful with an educational component um, and broad service training. I'd love if you could share more about this approach with our group today. Sure. Um, so I strongly believe, um, and I, I feel like everyone uh, in this forum, um, you know, has, has role modeled the same, um, but, you know, gone are the days of checkbook philanthropy where, you know, companies just, you know, write a, a check to a nonprofit and then go back to their main business. It is so important um, that you, you know, not only give these grants, but that you structure, you know, meaningful employee engagement opportunities that go with each one. And that's really been our mission at NBC Universal. And we took it one step further um, by partnering with the NBC Universal Talent Lab. And that is, for lack of a better description, sort of NBC's university. It's where we educate our employees and train them. And so for many of our, you know, obviously not every single opportunity, but for some of the um, you know, more deeper um, volunteer experiences, uh, employees will be nominated and they go to the talent lab where they are educated on, you know, who is the community that we're serving? Um, how, you know, best to interact with them, um, really creating more empathy um, and understanding about, you know, the plight of the community and what you as a volunteer will be doing um, to help them and to improve their situation. So, um, you know, we have, training when it comes to, you know, skill-based volunteering. Um, we are also, um, we, we placed an NBC executive on the board of every nonprofit that we've partnered with. And with that comes board service training. Um, so what does it mean, you know, to be a leader on a nonprofit board? How can you help um, even, you know, teaching basic things like, you know, how to read a form 990? What does a nonprofit's balance sheet look like? And what should you, you know, look for when you are in that role? Um, and, you know, how to help, you know, infuse uh, diversity, equity and inclusion into your board, into your organization. All of these things 
are taught um, in this talent lab experience. And then we are also um, about to launch a new experience um, with a great organization called Build On, um, where the model is a little bit unique. Um, the constituents, um, you know, the, the, the folks that the that Build On is serving are actually doing the community service alongside with the NBCU volunteers. And they believe that you can help break the cycle of poverty um, by engaging these young students into community service. And they go out and they build schools um, in Africa and they do unbelievable things. So we are going to be launching this um, in the South Bronx next year, um, where we will put our employees through you know, a multi-day experience where they'll learn about um, the community that they're serving you know, in the talent lab, and then um, they'll go out into the community and do this side by side um, with the students. So I just think you know, there are more deeper ways to engage the employees and educate them. Um, and that is really the new face of volunteering and, and how we can make an even stronger impact in the community, as well as an impact with our employees. Employees. Absolutely. Thank you, Hillary. Um, and Ty, um, you frequently talk about the importance of making sure Hollywood and other powerful industries like private equity embrace diversity, not just as a DEI mandate, but as a business imperative. And I think I heard that business imperative come around in the conversation today. Can you speak to your strategy on building companies based on both profit and purpose? Sure. You know, we, um, we, when we merged the company at the, the top of this year, we, we went out to further capitalize it and we decided to take on pri private equity money. We raised about $100 million in, in capital and we met with lots of folks. It's not lost on me that, um, you know, the deal that we ended up striking, we have multiple offers, but the deal that we ended up doing was with the most diverse team that we had met with, right? And I think it's because um, we all have affinity bias, right? Like, like attracts like. And so there is a less of a hurdle to get over when the other person, the person on the other side of the table has a point of reference for your experience when you're not, when it's not foreign to you. But regardless of who we were talking to, um, you know, the diversity of our team was structured in our business plan is critical to the strategy of our company, not because it looks like goodwill. Um, you know, we said our mission is to keep the world laughing together. Well, you know, you're not patronizing a team that, you know, has a, you know, black woman CEO and, and you know, an and African-American chairman because 80 percent of the world are people of color right 51 percent of the planet are women so it, it's that reminding folks that just because someone's underrepresented in your organization does not make them underrepresented in fact they could actually be um, a critical consumer base they could be sort of like critical ambassadors for that mission that they're trying to carry out and I think that if you, if we can make this a business imperative, right, for future facing our businesses, um, you know, you've got both sort of like the oldest and the youngest, the largest, oldest and youngest population that we've ever had. The, the way that as business leaders, we have to scale across diverse audiences to think about how to have our products and our content consumed. This is a really unique business challenge that we've not been faced with. And before, Consumption was a lot more um, segmented. Now, because of how open and connected and the amount of choice that the consumer has, particularly when it comes to consuming content, right? Like we are talking to lots of people at the same time, all the time. And that's a new skill. And you know who is best to navigate a diverse cross-section of audience, a diverse employee base, right? And so, you know, and then I think though, we still have to accept that we all have these areas where we can improve, right? Like we are, our company is 72% people of color, 53% women right now. Um, so, you know, we make sure that we're still monitoring how we perform in those areas, but I wanna always pay, place my attention on the areas where we have room to improve, right? Like how are we, um, you know, 
embracing folks with varying levels of physical ability and manifestations of physical ability, right? Like, how are we speaking to, you know, sort of folks with different cognitive manifestations of ability? Like, those are things that it's easy to sort of like rest on our laurels and check the boxes for the things that we're doing well. But I think we have to be very focused on what we're not doing well. And I think a part of, you know, to Daisy's point, you have to have a, a culture where it's comfortable to do that. So I think you kind of have to let everyone off the hook and just say, you know, affinity bias is natural. No one wants to agree that they're, you know, racist or sexist or homophobic. Um, and I just believe better of the world. I believe that most of us are genuinely good human beings who are trying to do the right thing. I want to start out giving everyone the benefit of the doubt. But I think we are very limited to our exposure. Um, and that's why kind of drawing it back full circle to, you know, sort of the mission driven company you don't have to have a super deep mission to be driving purpose and profit at the same time. We say our mission is to keep the world laughing together. We make content like cold as balls with athletes and ice baths. We make content like celebrity game face where people are playing games on date nights. Um, you know, we make, you know, content like the miniseries True Story on Netflix, things that are thrilling and interesting. We produce events that fill stadiums. Um, but what that does is we try to create highest common denominator entertainment, stuff that gets the most people together laughing at the same thing, because Kevin has this quote, if you can laugh together, you can live together, if you can live together, you can love together. We believe laughter breeds empathy. We think it breeds understanding. You drop your shoulders. You don't judge the person on the other side as much. And so, you know, we make content with a lot of levity and light. Sometimes it could be downright silly and we're still advancing that purpose of unity. Great. Wow. Okay. I and you know what? We could go on for another couple hours. Um, you guys are all just such incredibly impactful, powerful women. So I, I'm just honored to be here to even lead the conversation with you. Sadly, we only have a few minutes left. So I'm going to ask one more question um, and we'll kind of just do a round robin, just shout it out. You know, um, it, it, it's the work we're doing is, is ever evolving. It's backbreaking. It's emotional work. And it was said earlier by one of you uh, that the fatigue is very real. Um, what do you do to keep yourselves motivated and mentally fit? Because it, it's a lot. Yeah. The, so the first thing, jump in. The first thing I do is uh, take a lot of notes from these ladies. I got posted all over my desk some things that I that I personally have taken away from this conversation. So thank you. Um, but I always remind myself about the whys. So like I have three kind of key whys, why I do this work. And one of those whys is, um, can, uh, can I carve out a small corner of the world and make it better for a few other people? Mm. And as long as the answer to that is still yes, right? Then I know I might be having a bad day, but I'm still in the right position. And so when I think about the fact that you know, we're in our fourth year of Howard Entertainment, creating a pipeline of black executives from HBCUs. When I think about we are standardizing mental health on all production sets, when I think about we've hired deaf PAs to work on set, when I think about a lot of that work and that just, you know, in the first year of the inclusion policy and playbook, we have literally doubled the number of women of color writers and directors and creators. Like, so, so my why is still yes. It's a hard day, it's a difficult situation, but the why is still true. So, just reminding myself of the whys. Great. Anyone else? I would also say, you know, just listening to this amazing group of women, you guys have so many creative and innovative programs going on. And I think for me, the key is entrepreneurship. You know, we are in um, these roles, you know, that, you know, you can either just be an executor or you can be an innovator. And I think everyone here is an innovator and it keeps me super motivated. I mean, the Creative Impact Lab, which I referenced earlier, is an idea that was just born. And it is so gratifying, you know, to see the work that's come out of it. Similarly, our news division has, you know, the NBC News Academy, where we are starting a training ground for students um, from HBCUs. And, you know, that didn't exist two years ago. And so, you know, just remembering, you know, that we're all entrepreneurs um, and, you know, the sky's the limit and we can keep creating and innovating um, to do great work um, keeps me inspired for sure. Awesome. Hillary, I'm going to chime in because I, I write a weekly um, top of the week at Harpy email that I'm a little late on getting out and I'm going to 
use you executor or uh, innovator in that. So <laughs> thanks for that. Um, you know, really quickly, I some days to your point, it's really hard to do the work that we do. Um, it, it, it's hard to do any work because we've been living in really serious times. Um, you know, I remember I was writing one of these emails actually, uh, and it was the week that um, it was the Buffalo massacre had happened and then Texas was right after that. And I just had nothing to say, right? I was like, I don't I don't know how I tell people to go make jokes on the internet or stage a comedy show or even do something more heartfelt today. You know, I'm, I'm a mom and I was nervous to send my kid to school that morning. And it was just, what do you say? Um, and, and I was reminded at that point when I was writing the note, I pivoted it and said, on days like today, it is most important what we do to bring any little bright spot in the world. I don't think you can't laugh at everything. Um, in fact, there's a lot that's simply not funny, but you can laugh through everything. You can smile through things and support each other. And so, you know, I just try to remember to play and have fun in the work that we're doing. And lately, you know, we were at an offsite uh, with our executive leadership team. And I said to them, you know, the content doesn't magically become good at the end of the process. You got to feel good and have fun while you're doing it, right? And I feel like that's the same for everything that we do and the work that we do. We got to find a way to have joy while we're doing it so that it comes out on the other side and evokes the, you know, um, the, the impact that we hope that it would have. Great. For me, I really try to lean into the kind of the industry in a way where you think of, I kind of feel like in a way like, living the life I dreamed of, right? Like I always wanted to work in entertainment or sports or anything that we touch. Like I get to do that. And then I get paid to help make it better. Like, are you kidding? That's amazing. So to me, that's really like, no matter how hard the day is, I try to just like, I don't know, just think about some piece of content that we touch that I love or some sports game that we probably represent somebody there or whatever it is. And be like, yeah. I get to make this better for a, for a living and I get to get paid, you know, and, and do that. Like, awesome. How bad could this really be? So that's, that's what I try to do. It's been working for now. <laughs> I, I, I love that. I'm, I, I know we're at time and I'll, I'll, I'll close. I, I have to say, I've, I've felt really heavy the last, um, the last couple of weeks in particular. Um, I've had a, I've had a really hard time picking myself up and, um, and, and, what I've done for myself and just giving myself grace is that I've said, I'm just not going to, I'm not going to do extra. <laughs> I was like, I had to, I'm just going to do what I can do today. <laughs> I was like, this is, this is, this is all the energy and heart and spirit that I have right now. And you know, the, the, I know we all have motivational posts. The post that I have in front of me says change is possible. And that is what, that is what keeps me posted. And so I look at it, I know change is possible. But perhaps not today. I was like, today I need to take a little break. I need to take a little walk. Maybe I need a massage. Maybe I need something that's outside of this. And tomorrow I'll be better. I'll, you know, I'll be bolder and, and we'll, you know, we'll get we'll get through this. And sometimes I think we need to give ourselves a little break because in in the everyday of this, um, and in the trying to shine light when there's a lot of darkness. Um, I believe we can. I've been reminded of that very recently, that especially when it gets dark, we need to shine a light. But sometimes we don't have to shine the brightest light all the time so that we can just, you know, uh, amp it up a little bit. And so that's that's what's helping me right now and all my my truth and honesty. Yeah. Daisy, are you feeling the fatigue of sometimes defending your own humanity? <laughs> all of us do. But we've done it all of our lives and we've had to do it personally. And unfortunately, sometimes also in the places where we work. And that can be really hard as well. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. that. And Daisy, I'm also hearing you're setting boundaries. <laughs> I, I'm trying. I've, I've, I've been, I've been taught that for years, so I'm trying to apply it. I know it's not easy. I know I'm still trying to figure oh. out. Wow. I love that. It's like change is possible, but just tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you'll get this. It's going to happen. It takes time. It takes time. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't happen overnight. <laughs> well, um, you know, ladies, thank you so very, very much. I mean, you have truly inspired me. I can only imagine how the audience is going to feel when they view this. Um, I just want to thank you for your time. I want to thank the RAP Power Women Summit for acknowledging this group and bringing us all together. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Janine. Thanks, everyone.